Thank you, all thanks Ogren for having me today as a speaker. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the OpenStreetMap project, um, mostly in the US, but kind of an overview, the community behind it and um, what makes open a uh, street map open. So um, like John said, if you have any questions, it's always fun to have a little more interactivity, even though we're all on our computers. So feel free to interrupt me, ask questions when I'm on a certain topic um, and make this as interactive as you like. So with that, um, my name is Maggie Colley. I am the executive director for OpenStreetMap US. Uh, we are a nonprofit based here in the US that advocates for, educates around and um, kind of spreads the word about the OpenStreetMap project and helps it grow in the US. And with that, who has heard of OpenStreetMap? Uh, you can indicate in chat. Usually I ask people to raise their hands or stand up, um, but you can stand up if you want at home. Uh, the OpenStreetMap project is an open data project. It's a collaborative project to create a free editable world map. Um, it's an open license and volunteers and paid mappers all over the planet map their cities and towns and, and areas um, to build the best free open map of the world. Here's a little bit of history about the project. Uh, it was the story of OpenStreetMap goes back to 2004. It was created by um, a man named Steve Coast in the United Kingdom. Um, at the time, the Crown had a copyright on all geospatial data, and it was very difficult to get any uh, data for your work or your projects without paying for it. Um, so his simple goal was to create a free publicly available database of geospatial data. Here are some images of um, some of the first edits in OpenStreetMap. Uh, so in 2004, there were couriers driving around the city uploading their GPS tracks to um, a do public domain and sharing them. So that's the picture on the left is those initial courier tracks. And the picture on the right is one of the first mapping parties. It was done um, on the Isle of Wight. And you can see all the different colors are the GPS units from the different participants. Um, Maggie? Um, as you're sharing your screen, I, I think you're sharing the application instead of the entire screen, which is fine. But the other uh, boxes that are hovering over it, we can't see them. Yeah, those. So I don't know what those are, but they're just gray boxes on ours. So if you want to, I don't know if you can move those or if you want to share your entire screen either way, but the those are grayed out and interrupting the presentation slightly. Thanks for letting me know that. I think... Um... Anything Zoom covers it up, so that's unfortunate. Um, let me see Are you able I... to move them or to the bottom, maybe? Is that a little better? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, here's some of the first edits, and uh, here's a graphic that doesn't necessarily show who's actually editing, but um, the idea took off pretty quickly, as you can see. It's uh, gradually more people kept adding to this database. And um, I think at this point, we probably scaled way beyond Steve's wildest dreams. Uh, these are the registered users across around the world, uh, not necessarily the number of people who are actively editing. Um, I think there's a very sad uh, statistic that maybe half the folks who register for an OpenStreetMap account actually make their first edit. So. We're three, four million people um, editing. One of the questions I often get, and also probably many of you in the open source community, it's open, it's community data, can I trust it? Um, so I can like address that up front. I always say yes. Um, as the project has grown, so have the protocols and the norms and the, the ideas around how we make sure that the data going into OpenStreetMap is um, accurate. So there's um, a naughty word list. So it's in dozens of languages and the data gets kind of screened for that. Um, any major changes usually get pretty flagged, you know, country boundaries and um, major highways. Uh, and you all know the old adage, uh, with many eyes, the, all bugs are shallow. So same goes for OpenStreetMap and the data. Um, this is a screen capture of uh, a high school in Loudoun County, Maryland. And um, 
I don't show this to say that one map is better than the other, uh, but more so to start showing how OpenStreetMap really gets into the ground level details. Um, and its uniqueness comes in the richness of the data set and the ability to fill in all these gaps. Um, so, you know, you can map the forests in an on-map, but you know, in OpenStreetMap, you can really get into the trees. So I often ask people, who's making your map that you rely on every day? Um, do you know the person driving that car or creating the app? And with, with OpenStreetMap, um, you can know who's behind your map. You can look at every edit and figure out who added that street to your town or that point of interest or the, the bakery and see who that actual mapper is. Um, so what is so open about OpenStreetMap? First, the obvious is the open data. Um, who, how is the data being used? How are people uh, using it in things like COVID response? Um, the other beauty of the open data system in OpenStreetMap is the fact that it can change very quickly. Um, when COVID hit very quickly, the community created tags to start tracking places that were still open. If they had COVID hours, if they did delivery, um, things change for open hours. If you needed to wear a mask, if they had hand sanitizer, you can see some of the tags here. Um, and Mapathons quickly started being planned all over the world to help map areas. They're very localized areas to help people can still get access to the things they needed in their towns, um, even with all the closings. In France, they created an app. Um, I'm pretty sure my French accent. Ceres Ouvert. Um, and this project uh, really took off. Uh, because it was open source, it allowed many other countries to jump on board and um, spin off this idea to start collecting data around the resources in their communities and what was remaining open and, and what was affected by COVID. Um, this code is still out there. I'm not sure the projects are still active, but um, it's just a really great example of how the OpenStreetMap community can come together and very quickly respond to changes in our world. Another project I'd like to highlight is uh, by the Chio Chicas. Uh, Geo Chicas is an initiative that began around the OpenStreetMap community's annual conference in Latin America called State of the Map. It was in Sao Paulo in around 2016. Um, and their goal is to close the gender gap in OpenStreetMap community, where we estimate that women represent maybe 3% of the mappers globally. Um, hopefully that statistic has gotten better over the last couple of years, but um, here's a project called La Calle de las Mujeres. It translates to the streets of women and a group of women came together to start mapping uh, the streets named after women in Latin America and Spain. So they're linking the name of the street to uh, Wikipedia articles and um, showing the gap that has historically existed within cities of honoring women and remembering their achievements. Another example of using OpenStreetMap for change is resiliency maps. Um, this was created in San Francisco um, and the group puts potential hazards as well as shelter zones and resources that are available to you during a disaster. Um, there's a screen capture of um, the person who gave this uh, presentation at our conference in Minneapolis, mapped the conference center where the local hospital was, where the SOS points were and potential water sources. So there's this is free, this is open source, and you can create a map of your own city to um, print out and have as on hand to see where all these things are around you. And it draws on OpenStreetMap data. Hey Maggie, we got our first question. Great. Is there a governing body for policy, and as mentioned, naughty words, or is it member-driven? Very interesting and up-to-date spirit note. I will get to that question um, in a couple of slides. So thank you for that. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, I'll keep going and, and then just stay with us. Um, a most recent, I worked with a fellow this summer to use OpenStreetMap data to uh, measure sustainable development goals in cities across the US. And part of that analysis was to look at the completeness of OpenStreetMap data versus open data, it's open city data. And here's a screen capture of um, some of the maps he made of open space in Baltimore. So parks, 
cemeteries, um, places where you know you can be outside what's considered open space. And he found that um, OpenStreetMap was just as, if not more complete in most of the cities for measuring um, at least the open space SDG. And you can see in the, the center, can't point to it, you can't see me pointing. Um, the red areas are all golf courses. Those are the ones that were missing in OpenStreetMap. And we didn't include them in OpenStreetMap as a public space because they have to pay to go to a golf course. So that was a very nice finding. Um, and we have a video of this, this full report if you're interested in SDGs. We've got another question. Yep. Uh, they say, Steve Jernigan says, my company currently pays for commercial mapping services. What are the limits to commercial companies using OSM? I think we'd happy to be to pay to ensure the longevity of the service and offset costs. Good question. Well, there are many companies, probably like yours, yours relying on OpenStreetMap. Um, and here are just a few of them. That was a perfect tee up for this next section of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so a lot of these companies have started using OpenStreetMap and relying on the data for their, their projects and for many things within their companies. Um, we have also seen the number of edits from these companies go up. So in order to ensure quality, these, these companies are putting money into paying mappers and creating their own tools for quality control within the organizations to um, help the OpenStreetMap community and also make sure that they can rely on it. Um, another thing that these companies do is they drive traffic from other industries, so government and NGOs, and they, they bring OpenStreetMap to other constituencies and, and really spread the word. And they have the, the resources to do the volume work, like fiction production errors uh, for routing and contributing to the tools we use to edit, to query, um, to export, and even rendering out our satellite imagery for relief efforts and for tracing. Um, so I'm not sure if that completely answers your question, but the big answer is yes. I think if you are interested in not paying for commercial data, it's something you could look into and, um, and think about how these other companies have incorporated OpenStreetMap into their product and changed their models to uh, contribute to the project and give back to the community in a way that also um, can ensure better quality for what you're looking for. But as I get to it, I can't see you. <laughs> so, um, Steve, let us know if that didn't answer your question, but that sounds like a good answer to me. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, here's a, a kind of a smallest, not exhaustive list of other places using OpenStreetMap data. Um, in 2012, Foursquare changed. Strava recently switched to OpenStreetMap. Um, Pokemon Go changed to OpenStreetMap. Um, Niantic switched OSM-based maps from Google in, in 2017. Uh, there's, I won't go into a, a, a rabbit hole there, but there with gaming, there's always a chance that people will create um, data that helps them win. So we've definitely learned a lot from Pokemon and Niantic using OpenStreetMap. And then there's the humanitarian sector. Um, it was anticipated from the early days of OpenStreetMap that um, open free map data would be a tremendous benefit to humanitarian aid and economic development. And uh, in 2010, that idea was proven with the Haiti earthquake um, in an organization called HOT, the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team was incorporated in that aftermath. And now 10, laters, 10 years later, uh, they are growing um, by leaps and bounds, and their goal and ambition is to put 1 billion of the world's most vulnerable people on OpenStreetMap by 2025. Uh, they, they respond to disasters across the world and um, really bring in a lot of edits and mappers into OpenStreetMap as well and contribute a lot to the data. Here's a project they did to map for malaria elimination. They were um, mapping buildings that had been sprayed. Um, within the community so that you could track. So they had folks out in the field with sprayers to um, make sure that they were covering all the different houses in the communities. We had talked about humanitarian open stream map team for a while, but if you're interested in them, then check out their website. Um, Abdon you, also uses, you again? what is another question? Uh, no, actually, do you mind adjusting your webcam just a little bit? We sure. don't see your eyes very much. 
mostly it's your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awkward. <laughs> I can't see myself, so <laughs> the recording is great. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, Amazon uses OpenStreetMap to deliver your stuff. And actually fairly recently, their couriers started um, correcting roads, driveways, service roads, and um, updating addresses. So I'm not endorsing Amazon or any of these companies, but they're just useful data examples to show how much OpenStreetMap has grown and how many people rely on the data. May I ask a question about that one? For, yeah. um, are they um, are they active contributors at all, or are they mostly just um, using it? Very active contributors. So that, that slide I showed a few back of the growth of contributors, that was the number of edits that are made by these companies, not the actual use of the data. So um, I think that to call it corporate editor participation in OpenStreetMap has increased drastically over the last few years. We do have another question. Yep. Uh, can OpenStreetMap access the census API for thematic mapping? Um, I would, I wouldn't see why you wouldn't be able to combine the two. Um, so back in 2010, was it? Much of the mapping, like you'll see if you look at mapping in the United States, it kind of spikes. And a lot of that's because the data that came in is from the 2010 um, US Census Tiger Roads. So there's actually a layer now in OpenStreetMap, you can see the, the census tiger layer for the roads across the US and people have been working to fix that and, and align those roads for very many years. So, but um, I mean, it, you can pretty much do whatever you want if you to answer your question for the mapping mapping, if, but not directly from OpenStreetMap.org. Okay. Um, okay, so OpenStreetMap is open because of the data, but it's also um, open source. And there are many um, projects that are built on OpenStreetMap or are adjacent to OpenStreetMap that are not necessarily about the data. Um, but there's a diverse constellation of projects. There's command line tools like hardcore C++ backend tools, front end projects like the ID editor. Um, on the rendering side, there's Leaflet and MapNIC. And the thing that makes it interesting to me is like none of these projects are specifically tied to OpenStreetMap. They're part of the ecosystem and you can use most of them on a non OpenStreetMap database. So they're being built for OpenStreetMap. They're being built with the norms of the community, but any project can be part of something else. As you all probably know with open, open source, that's kind of the, the beauty. Um, so there's different ways to contribute, and that means that we have a very uh, diverse community of, of, of folks. We have mappers, we have developers, there's the data consumer side, local and regional communities and governments, um, humanitarian groups, all over the world. So a little bit about the community. Um, there was a survey recently we did for the OpenStreetMap US community. And uh, these are some of the things that people said is the reason they started mapping in OpenStreetMap. And what really came across is that people take pride in what they map. Place is very personal. Um, There were many of these and it was really fun to read them all, but um, I like the last one. An open map database is a major benefit to the world and that really is what keeps a lot of people mapping. So why is this important? Well, I wanted to put kittens in the presentation. So I don't believe that some things just shouldn't be locked up. Um, data needs to be accessible and OpenStreetMap allows for the democratization of data and really prevents a monopoly on place everything that you add to the map belongs to you. You can export it, you can use it to make your own maps. You are also able to see, like I said earlier, who is contributing data to the map, who's in that car driving and adding the roads. Um, every change set is connected to a mapper, like a human person. Um, and you can even click on that mapper's name and send them the personal message. 
Uh, here's a chain set of that Loudoun Valley High School I showed earlier. You can see who took the time to map every picnic table in the high school uh, campus. Maggie, is it hard to become a contributor? It's not. Would you like me to show you how to edit? Sure. How am I doing on time? <laughs> you got time. Okay. Um, you guys are teeing me up so well. How do you get the data into OpenStreetMap? So it's as simple as the, the wonderful, another wonderful thing about this as an open source project is that it, it's a very low barrier to entry um, as far as technical knowledge. So you go into openstreetmap.org, you sign up for an account, you check your email, and then you're in. Um, the ID editor is a good option for making simple edits and for getting started. So um, once you have your account, you log in and you click the edit button up in that top left corner and you start tracing buildings or drawing roads or zooming into, you could search for your hometown and, and see if your school, your high school has been mapped or your, the road near your house has the correct name. And mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's not correct, you can go in and change it and start exploring what the data is like in your area. Um, so here's, this is just a tip of, you know, you zoom in, you can see that that building has not been added because it's not outlined in red. And here the person is just outlining that building, doing as best they can to do the real footprint on the ground. Um, and then on the left side is where you tag it. So it's a key tag pair system. You wanna say building equals yes. So um, the editor ID editor makes it easy. There's a search bar, you can search for building, click on building and then it's tagged and that building is now available. If you were to download the data set, you could get um, just those buildings to be able to use in your mapping projects. There's also opportunities to map outside of your office or uh, desktop. There's a lot of different um, field and mobile mapping editors and ways to contribute here, are just a few of them. Again, this is not an endorsement, but these are just some of the ones that exist. Uh, there's one called Field Papers that you can actually print out um, the screen of OpenStreetMap, go outside, add the names of your local businesses, the opening hours, and then go back in and, and either um, use the QR code to scan it in and, and edit that way in the ID editor, or just use it as a way to take notes of what's been mapped in your area. Uh, Maps.me you can use for routing, same as other routing services. Um, but you can also, if you're if you're out and you see that the hours are wrong at your local um, hairdresser or something, you can go into Maps Me and check it and, and add data while you're also getting yourself around town. So there's some really great things that people have built on OpenStreetMap and um, through the community. Maggie, there's another question. Yep. Um, are there any plans to add variables such as speed limits or stop or yield sign? They're in there. Awesome. Yep. Um, so yeah, when you add a road, you can say it's primary tertiary. You can add this one way or speed limits or, you know, all kinds of tags are available within um, the tagging schema. So getting back to the question of how this is organized. Uh, well, the simple answer is not really. It's a data commons, right? So part of the power is of OpenStreetMap is just derived from its decentralized nature. But there is um, the OpenStreetMap Foundation. They uh, are responsible for setting up the servers. They maintain um, the trademark and the license. And they have um, seven, five here, but they have seven volunteer board members, a part-time assistant, and many volunteer working groups that people get involved with. So it's a foundation mainly run by volunteers. And they make sure that we are able to access the data Within that foundation, there are local chapters, uh, mainly represented by countries. Um, and that's where OpenStreetMap US recently became a local chapter. And um, we are also mainly made up of volunteers. We have a staff of one, which is me, uh, five volunteer board members, and we have a membership system here in the US. So if you're a member of OpenStreetMap US, um, you get discounts to our events and you can uh, vote for our board, which is great. We started in 2010. Um, mainly to hold our annual conference. Uh, we have had nine state of the map US events. I don't know if any of you, maybe you have come to one, but initially we were 
there to convene the community and bring people together um, and share our OpenStreetMap stories. We have grown beyond that now. Um, for nine years, we were an all-volunteer run organization and I came on last year's first paid staff. Um, we hold local and virtual events. Here's a picture of when we could get together. That was last year uh, to celebrate OpenStreetMap's 15th birthday. And now we hold um, bi-monthly mappy hours. Uh, we're putting together our first virtual event this month. It's actually next weekend. Um, our organization supports local groups. So there's meetups across the country. There might even be one near you. Um, local communities get together and map. A lot of it's virtual right now, but um, one day <laughs> we're back together. Um, our organization also has charter projects. One of the initiatives I'd like to mention is called Teach OSM. And um, the goal of Teach OSM is to bring OpenStreetMap into the classroom. So um, last year, and for the last few years, uh, Teach OSM has held workshops for teachers. Uh, here's a couple pictures of a workshop for um, 50 AP human geography teachers that we had in New York and teachers go out and they learn how to map and then um, come in and, and you know, hammer through all of their, their questions and then they bring it back to their classrooms and integrate OpenStreetMap into their lesson plans. So Teach OSM is there to support those efforts and grow that network of of teachers, educators, and other folks who want to help um, young people learn about OpenStreetMap. Okay, so that's that's it. How can you contribute? Um, you can sign up for an account, like I showed you, OpenStreetMap.org. It's free. Uh, you can go in and make your first edit right now. Um, contribute code to the tool sets. Uh, attend one of our events. Most of them are free. You can become a member of OpenStreetMap US and um, as a nonprofit, you can also donate and support our projects. So with that, uh, here's some additional resources of the things that I've shared. If you're interested in diving deeper into any of those, um, I can share this presentation with the organizers. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. We had a few other questions. Um, Forgive me if you if you did get this one earlier, but the first question that came in, the is there a governing body for policy? I didn't notice if you did answer that. Okay, um, governing body for policy. So each, it, it really depends on what part of the infrastructure you're talking about. There are policies around creating new tags. There are policies around um, importing data. So for that tiger import, there's there's ways that you would bring in a large data set into OpenStreetMap. There's, you know, within OpenStreetMap US, we have a um, code of conduct. Uh, so there's no police or like someone really in charge, but there's these other groups that are watching and making sure that things, things kind of run a little bit more smoothly. Yes, I can show that slide. And um, do you have a link or a way to share some of your slides or your um, maybe your social media information you'd like to share? Sure, um, I can share this. Is there something you would recommend for sharing the slides? Um, it depends. Is this uh, is this in Google Slides? Is this in PowerPoint? It's in Google Slides. Uh, you should be able to do a, a, a view only. Uh, share link out and then throw it in the chat if you wanted. Okay, then I'll stop sharing and do that so you all don't see my email. <laughs> um, does anyone have any other questions or anybody out there a mapper? I want to be a mapper. <laughs> uh, I've done a little myself um, at my company, <clears throat> working mostly with uh, Esri products, but um, it's been it's been interesting. So I didn't share this. I, I wasn't sure who would be participating in this talk, but um, there's now a new, there's an editor called Rapid. It's uh, AI machine learning assisted mapping. Um, and they have integrated, um, Esri is working with Facebook to bring in government data sets. So we, they have 
contributed to this editor to change it so that you know you can bring in the road file or the addresses of Alexandria, for example, and the mapper checks off to make sure that things are right, but they don't necessarily have to draw anything. Um, and also you can use the Arc GIS now to directly edit it in OpenStreetMap. They have a, an online editor. Interesting. And the tool is called Rapid? Yeah. It's a fork of the ID editor that's been changed to have um, assisted mapping. Sorry, I was just getting the link. There it is. It should be view only. So if you want to check that out, if I went through anything too quickly. Okay, and while you're getting that, there's another question. What is the underlying infrastructure of OpenStreetMap? How's everything stored? Hmm, on giant servers. <laughs> like really <laughs> physical ones. <laughs> um, are you asking me what it's built on? I don't know, to be honest. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a question about uh, funding. Um, obviously, if the data is submitted or people are able to edit things, that's community driven. Um, but the funding that is needed, just curious where that came, comes from. Uh, historically, for OpenStreetMap US, we've not needed to raise a lot of money because we were all volunteer driven. So. Um, we would raise money through our uh, community events and same goes for the foundation. They would have um, server drives because it is, I mean, I do know where it's stored. It's stored on a big server in the UK <laughs> and um, adding capacity to that at all over the, all over the world has cost money. Um, so, you know, we have a server here in the US and we have to pay for that through OpenStreetMap US. And, you know, we raise money through our events, through fund drives, um, kind of like a re your local radio station. <laughs> We put our hat out and ask for money. Um, I don't think that any, I should couch that. I'm not sure that any organizations have received like grant funding or um, besides the humanitarian open street map team. It's mainly been individual and corporate donations. Got it. Okay. Um, and then for those that do contribute, oh, is there a, how many, um, uh, approvals does an, an edit go through before it goes live? None. Okay. <laughs> so if you want to edit right now, it'll go live. Um, what usually would happen is it would be a reversion of a change set. If it was an, a vandal or a vandalism or a, an incorrect edit. Um, and most of the time, if you do something that's incorrect, we like to give people the benefit of the doubt. You'll get a message that says, Hey, did you realize that you drew a building over a road? Maybe you should, you know, work on your technique. <laughs> so yeah, is anything you edit right now will be live in a matter of seconds, if not minutes, depending on the server response. Okay, another question. Mark asks, how do you handle politically sensitive areas like military sites? This is a tough one. Um, there's, there's definitely eyes on those areas a lot. There, I, I believe I'm fairly new to the governance of this project. Uh, but I believe there has been a few situations in the past where people have had to watch closely um, borders. But um, luckily, I feel like they've they've figured out how to maintain that. I mean, get a, getting a notice if something's edited. Um, we do have a data working group and um, the board is pretty responsive as well. So there's people with eyes on, on things like that. You can't just turn it off for editing, but... Um, Okay. I'm sorry, I'm looking for the editor link for Rapid. Somebody just put that in as a question. Actually, you could, if you're into code, you can contribute to this project. There it is. We do a lot of things on our wiki. Um, so any of those rules or regulations or uh, guidelines that you would be like looking for on how we govern things uh, would be in that wiki, um, like our tagging guidelines. And um, if you wanted to introduce a new tag, like for example, I mentioned the COVID-19 tagging schema, like you have to kind of go through these steps to make sure the community says, yes, this is a good tag. We want to use it. All right. Uh, do you store contour mapping? 
there is a layer um, within OpenStreetMap that you can turn on. So if you go into OpenStreetMap.org, there's um, I could show you. There's different layers like cycle map, transport map, um, and you can add them on top. So there's opportunities to, to add your, your topo or your contours um, within that. But they're all separate from the main OpenStreetMap database. There's a lot of offshoots of OpenStreetMap too. So there's like open historical map, open railroad map, open ocean floor map, open you name it map um, that have a lot of information that you would, maybe it's not necessarily appropriate to be in the main OpenStreetMap database, but um, is still interesting and, and necessary. Sure. Open historical map is actually pretty cool. You can use a time slider and see how a place has changed over time. So like I can go map and map, go back and map Baltimore in 1950 and then see how that has changed. Someone's raising their hand, I think. Grant Hughes. Grant, did you want to say something? If you'd like, Grant, I can unmute you if you want to raise your, uh, say something. Somebody asked me how I got started with OpenStreetMap project. So Grant, so Grant's unmuted, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't have a, I didn't have a question. <laughs> no worries. You're just giving me a high five. I like that. <laughs> um, oh, that was from before. I, I guess I, I thought it would just like lower automatically. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. We just, just now saw it. Okay. Um, so I got involved. I was a, a GIS consultant for many years, um, actually mapping for an environmental company using um, Ezra products. And I quit my job to start teaching people how to use maps. Um, and I learned about open source. So I really started with QGIS and the open source geospatial community before finding OpenStreetMap. Um, and I got into OpenStreetMap through TeachOS. I'm actually I was teaching students how to make maps in QGIS and using OpenStreetMap data um, and you know, workshops with professionals as well. So I came in through more of the educational angle. Um, and then I sat on the OpenStreetMap US board for a couple of years before becoming executive director. It's a pretty organic path, but started with uh, GIS. Cool. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> Someone had mentioned the mapwith.ai. Um, are you familiar with that? Is that one of the tools you're mentioning? Yes, so map with, map with AI actually, someone will be giving an update about that. Um, like I said, we're having our conference next weekend at Connect, so there's um, an initiative, Map with AI, but the editor that I was talking about is is the rapid editor, and I dropped that in the chat, a link to that. It's definitely connected. Okay. And we got about five minutes left. Uh, let's see. Does anybody have any other questions? Uh, did you want to give a plug for your event next weekend? Sure. And there's a costume contest. Well, mainly from like the shoulders up because we're all on Zoom, but um, so hats, masks. Um, we have 27 speakers. Um, it's the first time doing an online event, but we're hoping to create something that we can do every year, even once we start going back to um, seeing people in person. Uh, so Friday, we have four hours of, of talks. Um, and a panel. And then Saturday, we have um, four blocks of workshops, birds of a feather session. So if you're interested in like open street mapping government or uh, the future of mapping with AI, or there's a couple of different places you can go and just talk to other, other folks um, and a few mapathons. So there's a project called uh, crowd to map and they're based in Tanzania. They'll be having a mapathon to they map to um, and female genital mutilation in Tanzania and throughout Africa. So they're having a mapathon. Um, the Youth Mappers Group, who is 
in charge. They have uh, youth map nurse chapters at universities all over the world. They'll be doing a mapathon. Um, and a couple other folks, Teach OSM, will have a session. So it's all free. You can register um, and join part of it or all of it if you want. We're going to have a mappy hour on Thursday evening just to get people together and hanging out in our virtual Zoom rooms. Um, so yeah, thanks. That's a nice. Hope to see you there. Great. All right. Anybody, any other questions or comments they want to share with Maggie before we close here? I did see someone likes to do artistic things. So yeah, I mean, you could put OpenStreetMap on a pillowcase, right? You could put it on your wall. Like that's, <laughs> you could do whatever you want with it, which is kind of the beauty. Uh, since you're talking about artistic stuff, that reminded me, uh, you talked about Pokemon edits uh, earlier, how there was an algorithm or something that was trying to make sure people weren't cheating the system or something. It, it, what, what's that about? I don't play Pokemon, but apparently there's these nests and that's where you find these creatures and they're often in like lakes or um, parks. So I think this is my understanding of what went down there is like people were drawing fake parks and stuff to try to get a Pokemon nest to show up. So um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's been taken care of, but uh, it was an interesting learning curve, I think, for people to see how a game would impact an open source data project in that way. I mean, I think they also use it for their Harry Potter game now too. Never played that one either though. Uh, so another question came in from David. What are some other of the most interesting things you see people doing with OpenStreetMaps data? Gosh, that's like the fun thing of this, right? I only shared these stories, but um, right now there's, there's a lot of mapping around social justice and diversity and um, you know, mapping we were started mapping, um, oh my gosh, sorry, <laughs> monuments that uh, were racist and, and places like uh, squares and, and uh, infrastructure that could potentially be changed. So people creating maps in the communities to bring to their local governments. Um, a lot of accessibility mapping, like mapping for routing um, for visually impaired or hearing impaired folks. Uh, there's I mean, and then there's the people who have the, the, the shops of like, let make me, I'll make you a map of your town for your wall or like on your textiles. Um, yeah, that's cool. The number of, we have all of our talks actually on our YouTube channel from the last few years of the state of the map US conferences. And um, if you scroll through them, there's just so much, so much people are doing, which is really great. Okay, there's another question. Do you provide the do you provide the ability to drop pins or alter the maps with JavaScript? So can you edit via API? I assume is what they're saying. Yeah, you can also add notes. Um, and you can, you know, if you want to meet someone somewhere, like you drop your pin and you can send them that. I think that's what you're asking. So can you if I created my own tool um, <clears throat> for my company or whatever, um, and uh, I wanted that tool to connect to OpenStreetMaps data um, via API. Would I be able to send edits uh, over that link, or would do you still have to manually log in in order to manually uh, draw your rectangles and everything, draw your polygons? You would be able to to send your edits. I mean, that's what like, Mapillary and and Maps.me and OSM and they're all external editors. Um, there's Vespucci. There's there's so many things that people tools that people have built to edit. So Absolutely. Um, you could hit that API from, from something that you built. You just have to, there's an OAuth system. And, you know, you have to have your username and set all that up. But yeah, you don't need to go into openstreetmap.org to edit. Got it. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I guess this concludes our session. Uh, unless anyone's got any parting thoughts. And Maggie, thank you so much for your time. I think it was very interesting and people seemed engaged. So I think they enjoyed it as well. Great. Thank you. Sorry, I showed you my mouth most of the call. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, I think I think your lampshade got corrected as well. <laughs> I did. I reached back there. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone for all the questions. I um, appreciate your, your participation and thank you, John, for, for handling the moderation. Oh, uh, I, I don't remember if... Um, you respond to this or not, but do you want to allow people to reach out to you? Do you have a social media profile? Yeah, I do. Um, 
Uh, I had it on one slide, but I'm Maggie Maps on Twitter and Maggie Colley. I'm on LinkedIn. So please feel free to reach out. I'd like to meet you.